The Roman Martyrology for today cites that today is also the feast, January 7th, is the feast of the return of the Holy Family from Egypt. So by tradition, they were in Egypt for seven years, and then they returned on this date, which is very interesting. And, well, you must read the Gospels of this Bible we're giving you in order to he find out the rest of the story. And so the Holy Family returns from Egypt and they go to Nazareth. And after another five years, we have today's episode where they are in Jerusalem and the boy Jesus is 12 years old. And what we learn from this gospel today is that God himself was subject to those that he placed in authority over himself. He was subject to those whom he placed in authority over himself. Which just points out the authority that fathers and mothers have over their families. But it is not an authority for the sake of authority. And it is not an authority that is coercive, but it is a, an authority that has to answer to God. And ultimately the father of a family has to answer to God for his fatherhood. His fatherhood comes from God. All authority comes from God and needs to be rendered back to God under obedience to God's commands and to God's laws. Well, we're going to take a look at the teaching of Pope Leo XIII. Now, Pope Leo XIII reigned as the Vicar of Christ and the servant of the servants of God from the years 1878 until the year 1903. Very, very long papacy. And he wrote a series of encyclicals about marriage, about family, about society, about economics, about government. And you could say that he, he, he painted a, a broad view of, of all of human life and how it relates to God, the church, and our vocations. And there's a, a very helpful synthesis of Pope Leo XIII's teachings that was written by Anthony Esselin a few years back, and it's called Reclaiming Catholic Social Teaching. There's a summary or a synthesis of Pope Leo XIII's teachings. And so I'm going to be um, just drawing out some excerpts from that book to paint a picture of the family that might be very surprising to you, very surprising to you. So we begin with the family, and the family is modeled after God himself, because you see, God is three persons in one God, and those three persons in one God are, are themselves a society. They are a society of love, and they are hierarchically ordered to one another perfectly. Now the prime society that God creates is the marriage between a man and a woman. And this is a human society that in turn is the foundation for all other societies. Now as Aristotle, who is a pagan, observed, Let's see here. The family and the household come first, and the state comes later. The state comes after the family, both in time and in being. And just as the family is for its members, both individually and together, so the state is for families individually and together. Now there are rights that we possess because we have been made by God and for God, and those rights touch upon our very being itself. But then there are rights, or maybe we would rather call them permissions, and these are granted to us by the state in which we live, and let us say the right, for instance, to a free public education for our children. Now that's not an actual right. Nobody has a right to education, that's a right only by an analogy. So it's called a right, but it's not an actual right, it's a right by analogy. 
These are rights that the community has agreed to guarantee. And some communities will guarantee a certain right because the families of that community have decided to do so. But they're only a right because the families have provided for that. Now, an actual right sh should be few. Rights should be few, they should be contingent, and they should be of narrow scope. Nobody has a right to education, and nobody has a right to employment or housing or health care. Nobody has a right to equal treatment. None of those are rights, even though you might have been told that they're rights. None of those are rights. The government does not owe any of those things to its citizens. A family is to provide those things. A family is to provide employment and housing and health care and justice and discipline. And a family is to provide love. The government does not love you. The government does not love you. The government is not your family. The government is not here to provide for you. It doesn't owe you love. Families owe you love. So to believe that marriage can be subject to the definition of the state is to elevate the state to a throne of an idol. Christian marriage, writes Leo, not only looks to the propagation of the human race, but to the bringing forth of children for the church, to be fellow citizens with the saints and the domestics of God, so that a people might be born and brought up for the worship and religion of the true God and our Savior Jesus Christ. All right, well, that's a good, it's a good church definition of something, but it is more than just a matter of piety. If we, if we look to Leo's thought, we will see that marriage is both a society in its own right and that marriage is a cause for society. Now, the human society is for that social creature, the human person. But society is not to promote the human person's self-love. It is to promote his fulfillment as a human being. Now, the husband is for the wife, not that she may do as she pleases, but that she may do as she ought. In the bonds of divine love and human love that alone set us free. The wife is for the husband not that he may do as he pleases, but that he may come to know that same freedom of doing what he ought in response to his duty given to him by God from whence the authority comes. Now, a healthy body supports the health of its members, and all, then, all the more then must a state support the health of families because although in a sense families are members of a state, they are not, as fingers are to the hand or the hand to the body, parts of the state without a life of their own. I'll repeat that. Families are not parts of the state without a life of their own. Now it is in, instead, as Pope Leo says, the family enjoys a priority over the state. The state, in a sense, is the creation of the family. The families created the state. And it is not the other way around. Hence, the family possesses rights that the state does not confer upon it, but must recognize and defer to. The contention, then, that the civil government should, at its option, intrude into and exercise intimate control over the family and the household is a great and pernicious error. For paternal authority can neither be abolished nor absorbed by the state, for it has the same source as human life itself. And likewise, the child takes its place in civil society not of its own right, but in its quality as member of the family in which it is born. This is why it, this is why it's so important that we have a family name, and this is why it's so important that families stick together and that the children aren't confused on which family they owe loyalty to. 
That, that's where things become confusing. Which family does this child owe loyalty to? A family name is important and connection to our families is important. When anyone who is homeless comes looking for help, well, what help can we really give them? I mean, we can help them out a little bit with something to eat, maybe some words of encouragement. You know, maybe you can help them pay a bill. But the only help they can really get is to reunite with their family. A, fa a family is the only one who can resolve that issue. The government cannot resolve the issue of the homeless because the government does not love the homeless. The government's not a, a parent or a sibling. Now, granted that law and authority are of divine origin, there can be no true human society without the virtue of obedience. Our Lord models this for us in today's gospel. He is subject to his parents. It is in this context that we must see Pope Leo's affirmation of a patriarchal authority. A family, he writes in Rerum Novarum, no less than a state is, as we have said, a true society governed by a power within its sphere, that is to say, by the Father. And this authority of the Father does not derive merely from human custom, and it does not, it does not derive from consent and it is the principal reason why the state may not usurp the rights of the family. Paternal authority can neither be abolished nor absorbed by the state, for it has the same source as human life itself. In other words, the authority of the father in the home derives from the fatherhood of God. Now that does not mean that human fathers are better or smarter than human mothers, any more than it means that a priest must be holier than a parishioner or that a head must be healthier than a hand. But it has to do with the vocation of the one who is placed in that position, not because he is talented, not because he is capable, because that is that his, it's his vocation. So it does, however, suggest why the decline of fatherhood in the home is promoted. The decline of fatherhood in the home is promoted by those who wish to enlarge the state, who wish for the state to take over for the father, to provide everything free of charge. Education, housing, health care, everything. It's not the role of the government to do so. But it also means that the father may not do as he pleases. His fatherhood is not primary. The fatherhood of the Father in heaven is primary, and the fatherhood of the Father in the home is contingent upon that. Now, if you wish to destroy a society and reduce it to a compliant, although vicious rabble, or if you wish, as we will see, to destroy the society of the church and reduce it to a bunch of self-willed parishes, themselves divided into factions and cliques and atomized individual all going their own way, here are some obvious things to do, according to Anthony Esselin, from whom I am quoting most of this. First of all, get the father out of the family, leaving it prey to the ministrations of the state. Secondly, get the father out of the church, leaving it prey to the vagaries of popular taste. Thirdly, get the father out of the Bible, emptying the faith and turning Christ himself into a fool or a liar. Then you will have in the family in the state and in the church, not law, but the exercise of raw will. Tyrannical power is the exercise of raw will. The will of the Father is perfect. Thy will be done, O Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. May we seek to do your will, to love your will in all things. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.